Welcome to my presentation. This year I'm going to talk about what I consider the best well-kept secret metric in the industry. I believe the electroacoustic community has a good understanding of the physics domain and all the measurement aspect of real testing. However, there's another domain that is even more important we could call human audio perception domain or how human beings perceive sound. I'm just going to call this domain the human domain. In the physics domains, we've been using microphones for years to characterize physics acoustics. Couplers help us using microphones to physically simulate human closed ear response. And over the last 60 years, we came up with very clever solutions. But they were limited in terms of frequency range to fully cover the 20 to 20 kilohertz human audio bandwidth. A few years ago, HBK introduced a new generation of head and torso simulators that fully move the acoustic transducer to the human domain. The 5128 hats has the average hearing of an adult and it is now approved as a high frequency head and torso simulators by the ITUT. RMS values are great metrics that have been used to characterize dynamic signal. They belong to the physics domain and taking 20 log of the RMS over 20 micropascal we can transform the RMS into dB or decibel, which stretch the RMS metric closer to the human domain, but not quite. More to come on this. On the time to frequency transformation, we have a lot of tools in the physics domain, but can we use them the way they are and transpose them in the human domain? I don't think we have in our brain a built-in FFT or RTA analyzers, as we listen to sound very differently. So we may need to use something else than traditional DSP. Regarding FRF, which is one of the most important metric in the electroacoustic community, the work that Harman did with the preferred frequency response really helped moving the FRF from the physics domain to the human domain. I believe it was a great attempt and give us a reference we can use when designing or testing headphones. THD, or total harmonic distortion, is a very physics metric. And most of the time, as human beings, we cannot relate to it. My goal here is to explain what is missing and what our solution is. The first thing I'm gonna do is to challenge the decibel representation by showing you how decibel is sometimes a crude way to measure sound. I'm going to play you a recording of six different industrial sound. On the top graph, you can see the time domain in Pascal and on the bottom graph, you can see the frequency domain. From the time domain, the amplitude of the six sounds are very different. On the frequency domain, we can see that their spectral content is also very different. But for now, just listen and focus on the loudness of this six industrial sound. Okay, so now I would like to present you the DBA time history of the six industrial sound. Do you see any differences? Can you rank the sound intensity or rather their dB amplitude or loudness based on the dB graph? It is quite difficult indeed, and it seems for that given example, all the sounds have the same dB levels. However, we can perceive that their loudness is very different. So what is wrong here? Can we still rely on decibels? Do we have a better metric that would correlate with how we perceive sound? Yes, we do. This metric is called the time varying loudness. This metric is now part of an ISO standard, ISO type 532-1 from 2017. So let me show you now the time varying loudness metric versus time of the six industrial sound. Clearly, in that example, we can rank the loudness of the six sounds from a human perspective. This metric does a great job transforming the Pascal, a real physics unit, into sounds, the time varying loudness unit. 20 years ago, when I discovered this metric, I learned that the time varying loudness consider the frequency masking of the human ear. When the pure tone is slightly above the human hearing threshold, low order harmonics distortion can be easily heard. However, as the tone increases in level, a masking curve gets wider 
and wider in frequency. This audio masking curves around our main tone is also called a critical band, or bark band. If the device generates a second harmonic below the masking curve, the second harmonic will be masked, and this harmonic cannot be perceived. Now if the device generates a harmonic 10 at the same level as the second harmonic, the harmonic 10 amplitude is above the masking curve, and you will be able to hear it. The second harmonic distortion can be as high as 10% distortion, but still be inaudible. So closer are the low order harmonics from the fundamental, and higher is the chance to have them masked, which shows that low order harmonic distortion may not be something important because most of the time we cannot hear it. However, regarding the 10th harmonic, which is considered high order harmonic distortion, it is audible at only 0.05% distortion. So do you realize how complex things can be when trying to estimate perceived distortion? An ideal human domain time frequency transformation should have built-in masking curves and should indicate if distortion is masked or not masked. I put together this example a long time ago, and I know it is rather simple to demonstrate live, but I'm going to rely on your audio system and potentially WebEx technology will cancel everything I'm going to play here, so hang on if it doesn't work well. In this example, I generated a 500 Hz tone, which is going to be steady until the end. Oh, if you do not have any experience with this type of graph, they are called Campbell diagram, or sometimes sonogram. In few words, the x-axis is the frequency, while the y-axis is the time. The third axis is the signal amplitude, which is color-coded. Warm color, leads to high amplitude, cold color leads to low amplitude. The Campbell diagram is a representation of a multi-spectrum FFT analysis. The bottom diagram is a single FFT frame or a horizontal slice of the Campbell diagram. So after six seconds, I'm going to introduce the second tone around the one kilohertz, which could be the second harmonic distortion. This tone will be masked, so you won't be able to hear it. And I'm going to increase its amplitude such a way that it breaks the 500 Hz masking curve. When the second tone breaks it, you will be able to hear the two distinct tones. Then, I'm going to bring back the second tone under the masking curve, and I will sweep the second tone to higher frequencies, and breaks the 500 masking curve. Then I will bring back the second tone under the 500 Hz masking curve, and sweep down in frequency this time. At some point, you will hear the second tone when it's going far away from the 500 Hz masking curve. So the traditional FFT physics domain shows everything that is generated by the speaker. But what it misses is the human domain masking curve. So I brought the time varying loudness in the frequency domain called the specific loudness, which is a representation of zones over the band bark frequency unit. The time varying loudness will show the masking curves and will be able to estimate when distortion can be perceived or not. Let's take this demo step by step. So at the beginning, I introduced a 500 Hz tone. You can see that the tone is showing up in the FFT analysis, like it shows up also in the specific loudness. After six seconds here, I'm going to introduce the second tone. Notice that the second tone shows up in the FFT, but it doesn't in the specific loudness. When I increase the amplitude of that second tone, see that in the FFT at the moment here. It's ganging up, going up, going up, going up. And at some point, it will break the masking curve. And this is exactly when we can hear the two tones. If I move up in time here, 
I will bring back the second tone under the 500 Hertz masking curve and I will sweep up in frequency now. At some point, right there, I'm breaking up the masking curve and this is when I can hear the second tone. If I go high in frequency, I'll be able to hear the second tone, no problem. At this point of time, I'm reintroducing the second tone, which is going to be under the masking curve. And I'm going to sweep down in frequency this time. And you can see that across that point in time here, the second tone will go over the masking curve and you will be able to perceive it. So let's play that example from the beginning. I hope it is clear to you that uh, low order harmonic distortion is usually masked and cannot be perceived with our own ears. And now what's about the importance of rub and buzz, which is a high order harmonic distortion? One of our colleague has a set of stereo speaker that he measured with an FFT analyzer and he found 6% of low order distortion at 200 Hertz. 6% is rather high and you may think the speaker at that frequency is bad, but when you listen to some music with it, everything is fine. The second speaker he measured has even a lower distortion, about 2%, and it is considered a bad speaker. If you look at the FFT graph, you can see there are a lot of high order harmonics in the signal, and those high harmonics are probably breaking the masking curve associated with the 200 Hertz. And therefore, without masking curve, it is very difficult to estimate and detect perceived distortion from this FFT graph. So be careful when you report low order harmonic distortion because this type of distortion may not be perceivable. On the other hand, I would always measure high order harmonic distortion, also called rub and buzz, not using an FFT analyzer, but rather a specific loudness analyzer with built-in masking curve like I showed you before. Another thing I learned with this time varying loudness metric is it takes into account the time masking of the human ear. In the example above, we have a random signal followed by a click. When the click is far away from the random signal, you can hear it. When the click is closed from the random signal, the click is masked and become inaudible. The time varying loudness transforms the physics audio domain into the human audio domain with a great fidelity by mapping the Pascal into sounds. The frequency masking of this metric is very useful for characterizing perceived distortion. The time masking is really adequate when you use non sign based stimulus like speech or music. That could be another presentation for later. So what's about this well-kept secret? Well, I'm not sure if you watched Dr. Wukun's song presentation he did last year at the same conference, but he used time varying loudness to characterize devices sound quality. Time varying loudness is the special ingredient of this measurement process. If you like to watch his presentation, just go on YouTube and use the keywords HPK, audio and BSR and you will find it. In few words, BSR stands for buzz, squeak, and rattle. This takes into account everything else that deviates from the device under test linear response, including low and high harmonic distortion. Dr. Wook and Song show a new human domain approach for characterizing a complete speaker transducer by exciting it with a lock sweep signal. He measured the speaker response and fed it into a time varying loudness analyzer. The result is in sounds, we call it NY. This NY response includes the perceived distortion and all their potential buzz, quick, and rattle triggered by the lock sweep stimulus. Then he did a linear deconvolution of the full response to extract the linear response of the speaker, and he fed it in the same time varying loudness analyzer. He called this curve NX. The difference between NY and NX is what is driving the sound quality of a speaker system. 
but this time we take the human audio perception into account. The algorithm he uses averages the loudness difference creating a single sound quality BSR metric you could use to pass or fail an electroacoustic device on production line, for example. I would like to give you a quick demo of the BSR app and I'm going to use the 4227A artificial mouth which has a very low distortion to begin with. In the app, I can specify my stimulus start and stop frequencies and its duration. I can define the output and the input sensitivities. I can generate the lock sweep by clicking this button. Once the stimulus is ready, we can just click the start mesh button. The top graph shows the NY curve, the full response in zones, and the NX curve, the linear response in zones. The bottom graph shows the difference between NY and NX, lowers the difference and betters the sound quality. The app calculated a single value BSR of 0.04 zones, which is the average of the loudness difference between the two vertical lines. To for the BSR, I'm going to redo a measurement, but this time I'm adding a piece of tape at the entrance of the artificial mouth. The tape will rattle at some frequencies and we should be able to catch that. With a piece of tape, we measure 8.24 zones, which is a fairly high value indicated we have a sound quality issue. We can clearly see how the tape generates BSR at some frequencies by looking at the graph and the difference between the NY and the NX curve. For people who are familiar with the physics domain and Campbell Plot multispectrum FFT, you can visualize the BSR effect right there. The multispectrum FFT shows the physics analysis but doesn't tell you how loud human can perceive this BSR. In the other hand, the BSR app estimates in the human domain if we can indeed perceive this issue in zones. I took this time a laptop and generated the lock sweep via its own speaker system. If the lock sweep is loud enough, the speaker will generate distortion and may rattle plastic elements like the keyboard keys, for example. See how the BSR app detected audio quality issues on that laptop within a few seconds. Well, one more thing on that example. A few years ago, I measured this same laptop with a measurement system called the Acoustic Camera which has 30 plus microphones on a wheel and an integrated webcam. With the acoustic camera, it is indeed possible to localize BSR right there on the DUT device under test. And I'm going to play a recording where the BSR is happening. You can see the BSR can be very dynamic and depending on how the keyboard keys are attached to the computer, they have slightly different resonances. Playing back a slow lock sweep helps identify what keys are contributing to the BSR and potentially fix them. Last, I took my BSR measurement system and measured my old Japanese car in my garage. I tested all the speakers one at a time by placing a microphone at the driver's head position. The BSR test system identified that the front left speaker was the one that created quality issues. The speaker has normal distortion compared to the other, but it rattles a plastic component on the front left door panel and the BSR metric caught it. Thank you everyone. If you'd like to test this human domain metric, feel free to contact me anytime. We have a few demo kits available I could send you. I believe the electroacoustic community deserves better tools and better metrics in the human domain, and I truly believe Dr. Wukensong's BSR can solve a lot of issues. We have a few minutes left for a Q&A, so feel free to type in your question if you haven't done so. Thank you so much.